This morning we're turning to John's Gospel in chapter 6. John chapter 6. Let me just remind you what has been taking place. The Lord Jesus Christ has been on the east, northeast side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, he was there, he was ministering, he was teaching, and uh, the day came, got late, and there was thousands, thousands of people there uh, listening to him, and he said to his disciples, you know, we need to feed these people. And uh, that is when uh, uh, one of his disciples found a, a young boy, and that young boy had uh, a couple of fishes and uh, some very small, not loaves of bread, but kind of just small pieces of bread. And uh, he said, that's fine. And he took them, prayed over them, began to hand them out to the disciples after they had the people sit down. There was 5,000 men there, 5,000 men, plus women, plus children. And Jesus kept on handing out the food and it kept on multiplying, and he fed them all. Afterwards, he said to his disciples, take some baskets. They took 12 baskets, they went around, and they collected what was left. Not, uh, not, not uh, the garbage, but what was left over. 12 baskets full. Then the Lord Jesus Christ tells his disciples, get in the boat, go across, go to the west side of the, of the sea, he then says to the people who were there, the large crowd, he said, now you need to go home. And then he went up into the mountain, up into a very high hill, went up to be by himself, spent the night up there praying. Uh, as the disciples are going across the sea, a terrible storm comes up. And they would get terrible storms there uh, because of the location and how that all was. And here they are fishermen, but they are struggling uh, probably not even being able to go forward hardly at all. They're about halfway across. Uh, in the midst of that, uh, and you can imagine now, they're not going forward by looking forward. They're probably sitting and rowing like this. So you're, they're facing back, and they see this figure coming along, and they're shocked, and they're, they're frightened. They don't know what it is. And the figure is on top of the water. And you imagine the waves and all this going on, and then... Jesus calls out to them, tells them not to be afraid. He steps into the boat, and immediately their boat, all of them, are on the shore on the western side. Now, the next morning, the people, the crowd, a lot of them are still there. Some may not be, we don't know. But a lot of them are there, and they begin to look for Jesus because they had seen him go up in a mountain by himself. They had also known that he hadn't gone out on the boat because the boat went first. There were no other boats there that night. Now, that next morning, some guys came from another area, and they came in some boats, but the people start looking around. They can't find Jesus, and finally, they decide he must have somehow gone across. He's on the other side, so they commandeer these other boats, and they go across the sea. They get to the other side, and there they find Jesus. And as they come to Jesus, uh, they been, begin to ask him things, and uh, they ask him, how did you get here? And he doesn't bother going into all that because he knows that uh, they're not really interested in how did he get there? They're interested, can I get more of what I got last yesterday? We're that way, aren't we? How can I get more? And uh, so anyway, Jesus had told them that they needed to put their faith and trust in him, to believe in him. Uh, they, in turn, want another sign. They want another miracle. And... Um, the truth is that without the Spirit of God, no one will ever believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when somebody says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to be drawn to Christ, it's because God's Spirit is drawing a person to Christ, praise the Lord. Because we are so sinful that we cannot do it ourselves. We can't say, okay, well, I guess I'm going to, I'm going to become a Christian. 
Now, some people may think they become a Christian by going to church uh, or doing some other things, but that doesn't make them a Christian. Jesus is talking about believing in Him. And the reason that we can't come to know the Lord by our own self is because as when we're lost, we want one or two things or both. We want to see things or we want to uh, feel things. And, and it, it's always been that way with mankind. We kind of talk about today that uh, people are kind of more into feelings, right? People talk about their feelings. And there's nothing wrong with feelings. God gave us feelings. Praise the Lord. I'm glad I have feelings. What a terrible person I'd be without feelings. And uh, so we have those feelings, but those are not what we need to be able to believe in the Lord. So these people are going to ask some questions here. Jesus is going to answer them, talk to them, and that's what we're going to look at this morning. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all of the parts of worship that we have, that you have guided and directed us in the Word of God. Being able to pray together, being able to come together to worship you uh, and fellowship with each other, uh, being able to sing unto thee, uh, to raise our voices, I have nothing to do with do we have good voices or not, that we can just sing to you, uh, give praise to you, uh, that we can open your precious word and, and hear from you. And that's what we want to do this morning. We want to hear from you, not from me, but from you. So I pray, Lord, you'll speak to your, our hearts through your word and that your Holy Spirit will do his precious and wonderful and glorious work in our hearts. And I want to thank you all again ahead of time of what you're going to do in Christ's precious name. Amen. Now, first of all, these people demand a sign from Jesus. In other words, another miracle. Notice verses 30 and 31. It says here, Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then, that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, and as is it written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, Jesus had just told them that the work of God, not their work, but God's work was for them to believe. And you see that in verse 29. He says, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Who had God sent? God had sent Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to earth. And he was the promised Messiah. And the crowd responds by saying to Jesus, show us a sign. Show us another miracle. That's what he said in verse 30. Therefore, they said, therefore, in, in light of what he just said to them, they said, what sign will you perform that we may see it and believe you? What work do you do? Now, remember, what had happened the day before? They had been on the other side. They had spent the whole day with Jesus. They didn't have any food. There was nowhere to get food. Jesus keeps a couple of loaves and some fishes, and he feeds every single one of them, and they say to him, show us a sign. In other words, do it again. Do it again. And, and they're dictating to him. And despite the miracle that they had just witnessed the day before, they still wouldn't do what? Believe. And they're demanding Jesus' credentials and response to who he was. And they're dictating. Jesus had been performing miracles, many miracles. Uh, not just the one the day before, and they had seen some of those miracles. They had experienced them. They had heard about them. You know, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus Christ says this about people like this. He says, they are an evil and adulterous generation that seeks after a sign. People still today want signs. Uh, they'll talk about signs and wonders. 
Uh, they'll go to a church that says, well, we got signs and wonders and those will help you to believe. No, they won't. If you won't believe God's truth, you won't believe any signs and wonders. God isn't doing signs and wonders in that way. Now, God does miracles all the time. Every time he saves a soul, that's a miracle. He's doing things all the time. He's answering prayer all the time. God does perform miracles, but we don't look to God to perform miracles so that we will believe something. It's because we do believe him that we ask. They wouldn't believe. They had seen the miracles. They had experienced the miracles. And all they wanted was another miracle. And let me tell you, another miracle wouldn't have caused them to believe. Sometimes people will hear the word over and over and over and over and over, and they keep on saying, no, 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 no. I don't need it. I don't want it. In this case, they have a want. They have something they want. And we're going to see this. Listen, unbelief is never satisfied no matter how much evidence is given. In Luke chapter 16, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, spoke to those who rejected the truth of God's word. And he said, neither will they be persuaded the one raised from the dead. Jesus said, listen, there are people that will not even believe if they see somebody raised from the dead. Really? Well, it's interesting that at the crucifixion, the religious leaders of Israel were standing there looking at Jesus and the other two hanging on the cross and they looked up to Jesus and they said this, they said, let the Christ, that is the Messiah, let the King of Israel descend from the cross and then we will believe him. After all the things he had done, all the miracles, he had, he had healed people, he had cast out demons, he had raised the dead, he had walked on water, he had fed thousands, he did all these miracles and more, and they said, we want one more, come down from the cross. Now, Jesus died. He was buried, and three days later, he rose bodily from the grave. There is no question about that. No question. You know what the religious leaders did? If you take your Bibles, or at least listen, I'm going to turn back to Matthew's Gospel and chapter 28. This is after Christ's resurrection. And in Matthew chapter 28, beginning with verse 11. Now, put it in your mind. Jesus has risen from the dead. The tomb is open. The guards are testifying to the fact that we didn't open it. We kept it secure. He came out of the tomb. We, we, we don't have anything here. And notice, beginning with verse 11. Now, while they were going, behold, some of the guards came to the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they had assembled, that is the chief priests, assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave, them, who, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money to the soldiers saying to them, his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. Now imagine this. These are Roman soldiers. These guys do not sleep when they're on guard duty. I had the privilege of being a, a soldier. I've been on guard duty. You don't go to sleep. You don't go to sleep. 
I mean, I tell you, there were times I did everything to stay awake. You want to get toothpicks and hold your eyebrows, not eyebrows, hold your eyelids up. These guys didn't go to sleep. And they were bribing them, saying, tell them you went to sleep. And then it goes on, it says, if this comes to the governor's ear, we will appease him and make you secure. Because if, if Pilate found out, he would have him killed. Guards, when you're on guard duty, you, if, you know, that's it. Now, when I was in the army here in the States and I was on guard duty, they wouldn't have killed me if I fell asleep. But if I, and I didn't go there, but if I had gone to Vietnam and I fell asleep, there were dire consequences. Now, we don't kill our guards, but sometimes they get killed because they have gone to sleep. So they said, we're, we're, we'll bribe Pilate so that he doesn't put you to sleep. And then talking about the soldiers, they said, so they took the money and they did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews even to this day. In other words, well, they kept on going around telling the same story. You ever heard of misinformation? Anybody heard of information? We haven't heard of that, have we? <clears throat> now the crowd told Jesus what they wanted for a sign. They didn't just say, give us a sign, any sign. They said, this is the sign we want. Look at verse 31. He's, they said, our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. By the way, you may wonder, what does that word manna mean? Doesn't mean bread. It's a Jewish word, a Hebrew word that means, what is it? That's what it means. What is it? You see, God rained it down from heaven, and when they woke up in the morning, it was everywhere. It was covering all the ground. And they said, what is it? What is it? Manna. Now, they could take that manna, and they could make bread. And they could make porridge, and they could make this, and they could make stuffing, and they could make all kinds of things. I mean, it was versatile. And, and, they, and they didn't even have a cookbook. <laughs> and they made all these things with it. And, and God gave them enough and said, you know, one pot of it for each family, it fed everybody. And don't leave it over, because if you, if you didn't use it up, it would, it would go bad in the, at night when you woke up in the morning. You had to throw it out. That's what manna was. And so he said, well, we got manna in the wilderness. Jesus the day before had fed them, right? They were hungry. They hadn't eaten probably all day. They were hungry. There was nowhere to buy food. You know, they didn't have one of those uh, trucks to come up to the place, you know, and open up the side and you can go and get something to eat. They didn't have that. And so they were dictating to the Lord Jesus Christ what they wanted for proof to believe him. They, by demanding another miracle, they were actually showing that they wouldn't believe. You see, you keep on saying, oh, give me more, give me more, show me more, show me more. It's not going to work. Because it's not working in here. You know what they wanted? More food. More food. Wow, we got food yesterday. And you know what? We didn't work for it. We didn't plow for it. We didn't harvest it. We didn't go into the kitchen and put it all together. We, it just was there. We didn't have to go out and fish for it. None of those things. I know those guys are better fishermen than I've ever been. Because if you had been waiting for me, we wouldn't have even had those two little fish. These people lacked sincerity 
and any kind of spirituality. Do you know what miracles breed? They crave more miracles. People are never satisfied. Never satisfied. And the truth of the matter is, we can all say the same thing, right? I think I told you this story years ago. I'll tell it to you again just because I like to repeat things at my age. <clears throat> when my wife and I first got married, we had the privilege of living in the end of a dormitory. And they had taken two dorm rooms and they made a whole apartment out of it. So the first, dorm, the first room you went in and there was a front room and a dining room. And then the other dorm room had three things in it, seriously now. It had a bedroom, it had a bathroom, and then on the end of that, there was a kitchen, which you entered in the, the other way. I've told you this, the kitchen was so narrow, and we were really thin in those days, <laughs> that if one of us went into the kitchen, and then the other one went into the kitchen, if the first one wanted to get out, the second one had to get out first. We could not pass each other. And we were newly married, too. And I said to God, Lord, if you just give me one more room, I think I could be godlier. And so God gave us another place to live. And we were really happy there and everything. And then one, I began to say this. This is the truth now. Lord, if you just give me one more room, I'd be godlier. And God gave me another room couple of more rooms. And then I said to God, Lord, if you just give me one more room, I'll be godlier. And he gave me more rooms. We're never satisfied. And none of those rooms made me godlier. None of them. You see, it's not how much room we have or how much money we have or what we have in homes or clothes or food or any of those things. That's not what makes us godlier. That's not what brings us closer to the God. That's not what changes our lives. It's the decision, number one, to believe him and number two, to pursue him and to live for him and to glorify him and desire no matter what to have a personal, intimate relationship with him every single day. Amen. To start the day with the Lord. To start him in prayer and reading the word of God and, and, and focusing our hearts and minds upon him. Well, what the people wanted was a repeat performance of the miraculous feeding they had just experienced the day before. Verse 31, notice again, our fathers ate the manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So instead of worshiping Jesus as the Messiah and the Savior, they wanted him to continually give them bread to eat. They wanted bread for their stomachs, not for their souls and spirits. Now, it was through Moses that the Israelites received that manna, that bread from God. But what they're saying to Jesus is, we want this continuously. In other words, we want you to do exactly what they experienced in the wilderness of getting bread, you know, for how long? 40 years. How do I know that? Look it down at verse 34. We haven't gotten there yet, but we will. Lord, give us this bread always. Not one day, not one week. Give it to us always. And, and basically, listen to this. If they want the bread for 40 years and then they'll believe him, most of them aren't going to be around. Well, Jesus would talk to them about that. Verse 32 and 33. 
Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Now, the first thing Jesus had to do was correct an error. And that's found in verse 32. Jesus said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. You see, what had happened, and we actually know this from the writings of the Jewish leaders over the centuries, is they actually wrote and tell the Jewish people, Moses gave the bread. I've read the quotes. A number of their rabbis, Moses gave the bread. That was the teaching. So they actually were believing that it was Moses who gave them the bread. Now, Moses was used by God to give them the instructions of what to do when the manna came down. But he had nothing to do with giving it. He didn't call on God and say, God, rain down manna. But Jesus knew that they attributed that manna from heaven to Moses. And I don't know, most of us probably don't realize this or remember this, but the Jewish people, by the time Jesus came along, they revered Moses greater than all the others. The other prophets, uh, all the Jewish leaders, they, he was number one. And it's interesting because Moses had said to them, a greater than I will come. And they were to believe in him. And Jesus was that greater one. But these people are ignoring all of that. Their, their minds are still focused on Moses. So it makes, Jesus makes it clear, Moses didn't do it, God did. And now here they are standing there asking the one who in reality is the one who gave them that bread, that manna. Because Jesus Christ is God. And that's where it came from. And now he himself is standing there right there with them and they're saying, give us more, give us more, give us more. Now, by the way, manna was perishable. Remember how I told you you, you would gather it? In the morning, first thing you do, you go and you get a, 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 a container, you filled it all up, you took it in, and you cooked all day long with it, did all kinds of things with it. And at the end of the day, if you hadn't left it, fill, filled the rest of it, haven't used the rest of it, then it would mold, it would go bad on you. You know, they didn't have refrigerators. Didn't have freezers, didn't have ice, didn't have any of those things. All they did was, and, and some of the people hoarded it. Some of the people held it overnight, so oh, we, we may not get this t tomorrow. And then they had smelly pots. <laughs> In French, French, it's called a potpourri. It sounds better in French, doesn't it? <laughs> it's a shame that Anita isn't in here with us to hear me wax eloquent in French. I think they have a concert. Don't they have a concert? Where? You should hear those young people play. It's really something. Now, unlike the manna, which was only given to Israel, the true bread from God is for the whole world. Notice what it says in verse 33. 
For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. God offers salvation through Jesus Christ to everyone who will believe. Here in John chapter 6, in verse 40, it says this, And this is the will of him who sent me, Jesus is speaking, this is the will of God who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. If we go back to chapter 3, and if you remember, in chapter 3 we have, For God so loved the world. In chapter 3, beginning with verse 15, uh, we read this. Jesus said that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 18 says this, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God, begotten Son of God. Verse 36, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but wrath of God abides on him. And then if we go over uh, to chapter 11. Beginning with verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? What he is saying there is not that you won't die physically, but you will never die spiritually. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will never die spiritually. You will be alive for eternity. Because as soon as our body dies, the Bible says that our soul and spirit goes to be with God. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. And then in chapter 20 of the book of the Gospel of John, verse 31. And these are written, John is coming to the end of his Gospel and he writes and tells them why he wrote he said, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. God offer salvation is to all who believe, regardless of their national, racial, or ethnic background. Now, the, the, the crowd continues to demand that Jesus feed them like he did before and like Moses fed them. Look at verse 34. We looked at that briefly a moment ago. But then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. What were they thinking of? Their stomachs. Too many people come to Jesus for what they can get in this life only. Now, Jesus does give us life in this life. He gives us life more abundantly. I could go on and on and tell you what he has done in my life, what he has done for me. There isn't a day that I don't get up and I say, praise the Lord, I can't believe I've actually lived this long, that I have been, had the health he's given me, that he has bless me in, in so many incredible ways and he does it over and over and over. He has given me life more abundant. I didn't come to him for that but that's what he's did. But those same people weren't interested in spiritual things. That's not what they wanted. Now, it's interesting. Jesus used two key words in this sermon. Come and believe. Come and believe. 
To come to Jesus means to believe on him. To believe on him means to come to him. Believing is not merely an intellectual thing, though it is. We have to believe the truth. But if we just give mental assent, before, before I was saved, I believed in Jesus. I believed that he, he existed. I believed that he had come from God. I believed all those things. I had the mental. That's all it was. And that's what most people who go to church have. They just have that mental. They believe all the facts. But it hasn't been transferred into their soul and spirit. They haven't surrendered themselves to him and accepted him personally for their Lord and Savior. Believing and coming means to come to Christ and yield ourselves to him and trust him that he is the one who died for us and has taken our sins and will give us eternal life. And it's none of our works, nothing that we would do, all that he has done. To come to Christ and believe on him means to receive him within, in our inner person, in our soul and spirit. That's what it means. I want to take a couple of minutes and I just want to go over what the Bible very clearly Quickly, what the Bible says as far as coming to know Christ as our Savior. We sometimes call this the plan of salvation. The first step is to realize that God loves us. God loves you. He wants you to have eternal life because he wants you to be with him forever. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. That word world, you can put your name there. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that includes you, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. The second step is to realize that we are sinners. You are a sinner, I'm a sinner, and our sin separates us from God. God is holy and no sin can come into his presence. The Bible says righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne, God's throne. Man is sinful, for the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. I've had very few people who have ever sinned, said to me, I've never sinned. And eventually they even would say, if they had the time, yeah, I guess I have sinned. And it only takes one sin. Sin separates us from God. God said through Isaiah, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you. And because we have sinned, the Bible says, Jesus says that we need to repent of our sins, turn from our sins and look to Christ for our salvation because he died on the cross for us. The third step is to realize that only in Jesus Christ can forgiveness of sins and salvation be ours. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Savior but through me. We cannot come to Christ, to God, except through Christ. You know, God loves us so much that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to provide the way of salvation. The Bible says, but God commendeth or demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, right, my, right now, you may be thinking, oh, Ed, I, I believe all that stuff. I know all those things. But the Bible teaches that it's not a matter of just knowing these things. You have to act upon what you know. 
For you to know these things and even to believe them is not enough. The Bible actually says that the, angel, that the demons actually believe these things. They believe, but they've never acted upon because they never accepted him. Now the fourth step is to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. The Bible says that as many as received them, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. We must ask to receive them. It's a gift of God, not of works. Jesus said to a church way back 2,000 years ago, and we could use this same truth, he said to them, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you open the door, I will come into you and sup with you and you with me. When we knock at a door, what are we saying? I want to come in. Jesus will never force himself into your life. Never, 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 never. He says, I'm standing outside your life. I'm standing outside your heart. I'm knocking and saying, I want to come in. You have to open the door. You have to open the door. So receiving Jesus means asking him to come into your life as your Lord and Savior and to help you to become the person he wants you to be. It's not enough to agree, to agree that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died on the cross. You must re decide to receive Jesus Christ in your life as your Lord and Savior. And you can do that simply by prayer. You don't have any fancy prayer or anything like that. You just go to the Lord and you pour out your heart, say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I sinned against you, but I, I truly believe that Jesus truly is God and he came to earth and died and took all my sins upon him, died in my place, and I am asking you, Lord, now, come into my life. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I surrender to you. And then thank him. Believe. He says, if we call upon the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. I trust that you will do that. And when you do, share it with others. Share what God has done. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have made it clear in your word how we can put our faith and trust in Christ. We're not coming, Lord, to get more bread or to get more money or to get more happiness or all these other things, but we come for our, to have our sins forgiven, to receive the righteousness of Christ, to become children of God, to become yours for now and eternity. Bless your word to every heart, and may souls come to know Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.